This series is dedicated to Brother Steve Coakley. Now, when we went to the temple, we were asking for all kind of books that they didn't want to sell us. See, when you come in, they say, are you a mason? We said, oh, no, we're not. In fact, we say very clearly, we're of a higher order. See, I use a, I use on my logo something that looks like an eye in the keyhole. So when they get to talking stuff one way, we just show out and say, oh, no, we're from a higher order. They get to, well, what's that eye? When they into these eyes. They be watching you when you start doing things beyond what they understand. So you just flash it and pull it back. Right? At this point, it should go without saying, Prince Hall, Freemasonry, and Sigma Pi Phi are not the same in connection or principle. Firstly, Boulay members are almost always college educated, a prerequisite not required to be a member of Prince Hall. These educated Boulay members are most likely graduates or postgraduates who are recognized as men who have outclassed their peers as professionals within a certain branch of expertise. College education is not a requirement for membership into Prince Hall or any other branches of Freemasonry for that matter, whose tenants are most essentially being male, having belief in a supreme being as well as the ability to handle financial obligations of the society. Although Boule members can be Prince Hall members and vice versa, they play different roles within the structure of black society. Where Prince Hall is represented by over 300,000 men, Sigma Pi Phi is represented by only 5,000 men. And these aren't their only differences. Prince Hall, of course, is much older than Sigma Pi Phi, getting its charter from England shortly after the American Revolution, making it nearly 120 years before the creation of the Boulay in 1904. The origins of Prince Hall Freemasonry have a more solidified historical foundation as compared to the latter. Despite the questions of race or status regarding its earliest members, their parentage from the Premier Grand Lodge of England is well attested. On the other hand, the creation or sudden formulation of the boule has a far less equivalent surface history, where Prince Hall wears the logo of Freemasonry under its European certification. The Masons claim a history going back to the construction of the Temple of Solomon. The boule claims no such thing, only that their organization is mirrored after such. Comment or question? Yes. I know that the boule is typically a closed social group that um, I would characterize maybe somewhat secretive. Uh, how do they react to you exposing them, discussing their their um, being and their their principles in your book? Okay, Sigma Pi Phi Boule, um, which was founded at the turn of the century, was was founded as a secret organization. It actually. Um, 
it actually opened up once it became, once it started a Boule Foundation in the late 70s and early 80s, it's no longer a secret organization. I should give a little background, a little bit of background about that, about the group. Um, it's, a, it's a black men's frater um, fraternity that is, it's not a college fraternity. It's different from, um, from, from your fraternity and the other fraternities we were talking about, but it's a fraternity that is joined, um, that um, adult men join as once they are out in the real world as professionals or whatever they're doing. And it happens to have, I don't know, I, my, my guess is it's probably the largest percentage of, of, of black mayors and black politicians and, and, um, and professionals. It was, there are non-blacks, there are white um, members of the organization. The first members of Sigma Pi Phi were mostly educated physicians who could pass as white, where the first members of Prince Hall were accelerated through the church many of them whom had been slaves and uneducated. This process was the means by which a person born into slavery could reach social viability. The first so-called black politicians in America were almost all exclusively Prince Hall Freemasons, with a few exceptions. And similar to members of the Boule, many could also pass for white but not all. A common characteristic for the first illustrious so-called African Americans to rise into prominence was a melanin deficient parent, in most cases, a father. This outcome was mostly a result of Virginia colonial slave statute, partus sequitur ventrum. That which is brought forth follows the womb, meaning the legal status of a child born of an enslaved Indian woman will always remain enslaved. This law gave planters and free white men in general carte blanche authority to impregnate captured women without having to so much as even claim responsibility for their mixed race children. Just as common, these children were sold on the mulatto maid market as house niggas for an added sticker price as compared to their darker skinned counterparts. In this aspect, Virginia colonial law was totally contradictory to English common law, which states that a child's status follows the father. Of course, this law extending from the earlier Virginia codes was designed this way to assure legalized rape of indigenous women without consequence and naturally the perpetuation of slavery through a duplicitous modification of English common law. Children born of a white mother and black father were considered free and were counted among free people of color. White men were freely allowed to abandon or kill their children without recourse, solidifying their position as the first deadbeat dads in American history to the point that many of the most notable so-called black men in history like Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington never even knew who their white fathers were. But in some cases, the white father actually did remain in their child's life, but used their whiteness to accelerate the social status of their mixed children. One such example of this was Blanche Bruce, the son of a Virginia planter who became the first so-called African-American to be elected and serve a full term as U.S. Senator. To let Bruce tell it, he escaped slavery and attended Oberlin College, a school intended for well-connected blacks, and became his own man, a real bootstrap story, rather than the truth of him being stewarded by his Caucasian father. A common practice of Virginia slave owners was to allow their mixed children to escape rather than freeing them as not to involve identification or documentation of the state. Thomas Jefferson did this, and his mixed children assumed white identities for the rest of their lives. It would have been a lot easier for a Virginia slave to cross the Mason-Dixon line just over a hundred miles away to fight for the Union than to cross the Mississippi River over a thousand miles away. But the forced migration of slaves in the Upper South is a tale untold 
by the known perpetrators. Blanche Bruce acquired over a thousand acres of land in Mississippi, built a plantation and hired black sharecroppers whom he basically treated like slaves. To say Bruce was disconnected from the average black person was an understatement. He and his wife, Josephine Wilson, were well-known Aristo black socialites and rubbed elbows with the least ashy of the black community, or possibly the most ashy, depending on how you look at it. After the death of Blanche in 1898, Josephine accepted a job offer from Booker T. Washington to become principal at Tuskegee. During her tenure, she faced criticism from black faculty members as they regarded her as a wealthy white outsider with no real connection to the students. Later in her life, Josephine would become a champion for women's rights, writing several publications endorsing feminism and public assimilation through education for the advancement of so-called blacks. Be all this as it may, she and her husband Blanche had split reviews from the people. Most Aristocoons share this common problem, their social detachment from the general populace they claimed to represent. At the root of their influence were wealthy whites, and at the root of their feelings about the average so-called Negro was arrogant antipathy, no different than the attitude taken by their white masters. After all, this class of Negroes were the privileged children of white slave masters, all of a sudden turned champion for black rights. The air of insincerity permeated this bunch. With all this being said, there were some who made it into politics without completely alienating themselves from the average person. And Prince of Freemasons played this vital role within black communities, being far more well-connected to the pulse of the people through the church, as opposed to education. Establishing a solid base among the indigenous who weren't seen as privileged or elite. For most so-called Negroes, an elite education or even a college education was out of the question, unless you could pass for white. And this complexional complication coupled with education represented the foundational differences between a Prince Hall Mason and a Boule during the early 20th century. The Prince Hall faction, along with their Baptist and Methodist leadership within the church, recruited more of the common man into their ranks. The few and far between men who ascended into politics were more the exception than the rule. During these times, barbering was a trade that provided opportunities for black men to facilitate respectable positions within their communities. In some cases, developing clientels with wealthy men which led to other work for family and friends. In addition to barbering and the church, military service was another conduit by which a black man might ascend to notoriety. Often free northern blacks were used to recruit enslaved men deeper in the south, dangling the promise of freedom for participation in the Union Army over their nappy heads. searching our kind of people, I also noticed that this is a very insular group. These are folks who do not socialize outside of their own community. And when I say their own community, they don't socialize um, in church 
or in social situations or business settings outside of the people that they consider to be their kind of people. That's why when I got to different cities, I would ask them about various churches, and I found almost uniformly that in each city there was a church where the um, the old guard black families belong to. And what's most interesting is that even though most African Americans in this country have been traditionally um, Baptist, this group is primarily Episcopalian and Congregationalist. So in each city there was a, a, um, a Congregational Church and an Episcopal Church, like for instance in Washington it was always St. Luke's where this group, this group belonged to. So, but when I travel from city to city, um, I would often ask individuals about some of the high-profile celebrities. So, for example, when I was in Philadelphia, I would ask people, um, was, was Bill Cosby a member of the black upper class in Philadelphia? And almost uniformly, these old families said, absolutely not. He's an entertainer. So that was another um, aspect that I found within this group was that they didn't like entertainers. They didn't like people who had made money through sports. They wanted people... Um, as a part of their group who had who had gotten money through through medicine through law through business so it was a very very um, exclusive group and I mean that in every sense of the word where they were quick to exclude anyone who they felt was new and um, since you folks are from the DC area you know um, in Washington you are new at least among this community if you have not been here for three or four generations uh, so it's 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 quite interesting how the black upper class differs from city to city. One major difference I found were the differences um, that the southern cities, southern cities, particularly Atlanta, Nashville, and Washington, how they were distinguished from northern cities. Uh, I found in New York that if you had money, uh, easy to break into the upper class, the black upper class. It was a more fluid group. New York and Los Angeles were more accepting of, of people who who had been, um, who had earned money in recent years, and they didn't have to necessarily be able to answer the question where their grandfather grew up medical school. But it seemed that the stakes were much higher in cities like Washington and Atlanta, where the group held on much tighter to who they were going to allow in and who was not going to be um, accepted in their community. A lot of people. Um, were offended and, and uh, had questions about the opening lines of this, of this book, but I just want to read them to you. Um, Bryant Gumbel is, but Bill Cosby isn't. Lena Horne is, but Whitney Houston isn't. Andrew Young is, but Jesse Jackson isn't. Um, and neither is Maya Angelou, Alice Walker, Clarence Thomas, or Quincy Jones. And even though both of them try extremely hard, neither Diana Ross nor Robin Givens will ever be. Um, a lot of people ask me, you know, where did those lines come from? Why did you, why, why did you come up with something like that? And where I came up with, with those names was that visiting every city, when I got to Los Angeles, I would ask about some of the prominent blacks who had grown up in, in Los Angeles, um, and just as I'd done for Bill Cosby in Philadelphia. And constantly people would say things like, oh, no, she's not our kind of people, or no, he's not our kind of people, because this group very firmly knew who was in and who was not. So, uh, and, and they even knew who had married in and who had been born in. Uh, so, as I discovered that the black upper class, as it defines itself, is not that different from how different segments of the white upper class defines itself. Who's been around a long time? Who, who's new to the community? Um, who earned their money in a way that we, 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 we accept? And who's earned money in a way that we don't accept? No beginning, there ain't no
As mentioned earlier, the forced migration of slaves in the Upper South is a tale untold by the known perpetrators. Quote, From Slavery and Forced Migration in the Antebellum South by Damien Pargus. Quote, The cotton and sugar regions received a majority of interstate slave migrants in the antebellum period. The four largest importers, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas alone received more than 75%. A majority of long-distance slave migrants, however, were transferred to the frontier states that lay just north of the Cotton Kingdom. States such as Kentucky, most of Tennessee and Missouri. Kentucky's slave population grew from just more than 40,000 in 1800 to more than 225,000 in 1860. Tennessee's mushroomed from 13,500 in 1800 to almost 276,000 on the eve of the Civil War. And Mississippi's grew from only 3,000 in 1810 to almost 115,000 in 1860. Indeed, many early slave migrants from Virginia and Maryland accompanied their masters to these territories and states in the opening decades of the 19th century, often in search for better opportunities to cultivate and manufacture tobacco. As Missouri historian Diane Muti Burke has argued, Upper White South migrants were first and foremost enticed westward by the promise of reasonably priced fertile land in the bottomlands of the Missouri and Mississippi rivers and their tributaries. But they were also attracted by the possibility of replicating a farming and slaveholding experience much like the one they left in the East. Slaves living in states such as Virginia and Maryland were therefore constantly confronted with the prospect of moving west into the expanding frontier. To some extent, the large-scale westward migration to the border states was a chain migration with slaveholding families and neighbors from specific counties following each other into the territories of the new frontier. Between 1810 and 1830, for example, several leading slaveholding families from struggling Fairfax County, Virginia, departed for Kentucky, and a number of them pressed on and ended up in Callaway County, Missouri. Henry Clay Bruce, a former slave from Virginia, claimed that his master moved west because his brother-in-law was going west. According to Bruce, his owner became greatly dissatisfied with his home and surroundings and being persuaded by his brother-in-law, W.B. Bruce, who was preparing to go to the Western country, as Missouri and Kentucky were called, he decided to break up his Virginia home and take his slaves to Missouri in company with Mr. W.B. Bruce. By the 1830s and 1840s, settlers in Kentucky, Missouri, and Tennessee were also importing slaves from the Eastern seaboard, albeit in lower numbers than their counterparts in the cotton and sugar plantations. Quote, because of the success of cotton and sugar in the Deep South, the prices for Virginia slaves had become monstrous high. And that in fact is the very reason so many were willing to sell, and sell they did. According to the Virginia State Legislator's own estimates in 1832, at least 6,000 slaves yearly were exported from Virginia to other states. Virginians openly admitted that theirs was a Negro raising state for other states and that the interstate slave trade was an important source of wealth to their struggling economy. J.D. Paxton, a Virginia reverend, tellingly declared that the best blood in Virginia flows in the blood of the slaves. Selling slaves south became so common in the Chesapeake that the local population became virtually desensitized to it, something that never failed to amaze northern visitors. One Virginia overseer charged with bringing one of his employer's slave girls to Richmond to be sold to traders in the 1850s was astonished to be asked by a northern visitor what his employer was selling her for. Sell her for, he exclaimed. Why shouldn't he sell her? 
He sells one or two of them every year. He wants money for them, I reckon. By the late antebellum period, even the other tobacco and mixed grain states of the Upper South, such as Kentucky and Missouri, were starting to export slaves to the Deep South following the same boom and bust cycle as their eastern counterparts. End quote. So he was writing all this down and he said, you know, this would make a great book. And I said, well, I really don't think so because anybody who cares about it is already participating in these organizations and folks that don't know about it don't need to know about it because it's kind of beside the point. And he said, um, well, I think that it would be extremely helpful and it's a part of American history. So that's why I, um, that's why I started researching, researching the book and I spent six years doing that and looking into not just the old families, because my intent was to profile 12 different cities, uh, to look at Washington, Atlanta, which are probably two of the most prominent of the city, uh, historic black um, elite family, black um, elite families in these organizations and schools. I wanted to look at the colleges like Howard and Morehouse and Spelman and, and Fisk, as well as the different other social organizations like the Lynx that was founded in the 1940s for, for black women and um, um, the Girlfriends and the Guardsmen and the Boule, various organizations for men. And to look at the fraternities like the, the Alphas and the Kappas and the Omegas and talk about why these organizations were created, what value they've brought to the society, and also to see some of the distinctions, because a lot of people have looked at my book and they, they've seen that a lot of the photos are of light complexion black folks, and they say, well, why are all the blacks light complexion? And historically, the black upper class has been light complexion because the group started from slavery when the slave owners divided us on the plantations into the, excuse my French, the field niggers and the house niggers, and that was the term that was used, um, where they had the, the dark-skinned slaves working in, the, in the, the worst labor and then the light-skinned slaves working in the quote-unquote prestige slave jobs as the mammies, the cooks, the butlers, the servants. Um, and of course, those were the ones who were also forced to procreate with the white slave owners, thus creating uh, um, more light-skinned offspring, still slaves nevertheless. But they were also the ones who got the better treat their food, clothing, and also the ones who had clothing, and also the ones who ultimately were allowed to be educated. So it was that caste system that really created the black upper class. Quote, the specific occasions for selling slaves varied. But upon estate divisions, especially sales to interstate slave traders, either directly or through public auctions, were the order of the day in the Upper South. As the heirs of struggling slaveholders struggled to pay off the debts of the estate or simply cashed in on their inheritance. Planters in the region had a reputation for hiding their de facto property and not paying their debts until they died as one Virginian put it. Consequently, the death of every slaveholder attracted swarms of creditors, and slaves were often among the first to be sold off to settle open accounts. Continuing, in 1835, for example, five heirs of Francis Lightfoot Lee, master of Sully Plantation in Northern Virginia, decided to sell the slaves attached to his estate to the Deep South to pay off debts. They instructed an agent to see if it will be possible to get any or all of those Negroes off. The sooner the arrangements are made, the better. Estate sales to local traders often resulted in lawsuits as bickering heirs impatient to convert their human property into cash quibbled over the proceeds. Eleanor Berry, the trustee of one Benjamin Berry of Prince George's County, Maryland, was taken to court by her relatives in 1830 for illegally taking it upon herself to sell and dispose of various Negro slaves, including one bondswoman named Rachel, whom she bargained and contracted with Franklin and Armfield for deportation to the Deep South. Such occurrences became standard in the 19th century, but slaveholders in the Upper South did not always have the luxury of waiting for death to settle their accounts. Court-ordered sales were often executed when creditors called their loans, and many masters voluntarily 
called their labor forces when financial distress compelled them to do so. Despite claims that their slaves were natural extensions of their own families, slaveholders viewed their bondspeople first and foremost as capital investments that could be liquidated when they, the white part of the plantation family, needed money. Indeed, as agricultural productivity declined, even the oldest and most well-established slaveholding families in the Chesapeake were forced to sell slaves south for cash, a situation they often found embarrassing if necessary. Bushrod Washington, the nephew of George Washington and master of Mount Vernon Plantation in Northern Virginia. I'm going to pause for one second here. Remember Bushrod Washington founded the American Colonization Society. And of course, their goal was to move indigenous Americans to Africa. Continuing, Bushrod Washington, the nephew of George Washington and master of Mount Vernon Plantation in Northern Virginia, sold 55 of his slaves to a Louisiana planter in 1821 for the sum of $10,000, an act that broke up several families. Finding it necessary to publicly explain his decision, he claimed to a local newspaper that he had struggled for 20 years to turn a profit from the products of their own labor. But his slaves being worse than useless and his plantation losing between $500 and $1,000 per year, he thought he had no choice. End quote. Surprise, he didn't just move him to Africa. 230 years ago, in an age when most African Americans in the North and South were still slaves, Prince Hall and 13 other free men of color were installed as Masons by a white military officer. Their initiation was ratified in 1784 with a charter from the Grand Lodge of Great Britain, the colonial power Prince Hall had just fought against. Leslie A. Lewis is Grand Master of Boston's founding Prince Hall Lodge No. 1. On July 3rd, 1776, Prince Hall started the first black lodge called African Lodge No. 1. Now, because they were a lodge under dispensation, they were not allowed to enlist or bring in new members. All they could do was march on St. John's Day and bury their dead. But as time went on, Prince Hall petitioned the Grand Lodge of England for a charter to act as a regular lodge, to bring in more members, and the charter was granted. And from that point on, um, it goes on and on. Up to this date, there are over 49 Grand Lodges in the Western Hemisphere and almost 400,000 Prince Hall Masons. So Prince Hall Masonry has thrived from that date the end of slavery allowed Prince Hall Masonry to spread southward, a faithful facsimile of the ancient brotherhood with the same codes and costumes, yet never fully accepted as its equal. Knowing the history of Prince Hall as we do, Prince Hall was a man that never gave up. And I think that if Prince Hall could look at Prince Hall Masons today, he'd be pleased with what he saw. The legacy of Prince Hall and his black brother Masons is staring down an uncertain future. This is Richmond, Virginia. 500 Prince Hall Masons are gathering tonight to elect a new state Grand Master. At 48, Curtis Vaughan is the youngest Grand Master of the state. In his opinion, Prince Hall Masonry was essential to black society in the racially charged South. My name is Curtis S. Vaughan, Jr., and I am a Prince Hall Freemason. During the late 50s, late 40s, and 30s, there was nothing for a person of color to basically to do except to go to church during the leisure hours and to affiliate with the order known as Prince Hall Freemasonry. I found out that I had an uncle that was a Mason from Providence, Rhode Island. He was also a past Grand Master. And he shared with me all of the thoughts about um, what he did when he was younger, how he couldn't do this or do that, but Masonry was his door the door that opened for him. I constantly saw my father with his ritual, uh, with these strange individuals coming to our, our home, uh, 
and staying for about two or two and a half hours, and I could never go up where they were, and I could never hear what they were talking about, but I know that they all had little black books, and occasionally they would dress up, put on a black suit and a white apron, and go somewhere. When I became of age, I uh, filled out a petition, gave it to my father, he submitted it, and I was approved for initiation um, into the Prince Hall Masonic Lodge in Virginia. Hiram Revels of North Carolina was a barber, AME minister, college president, soldier, recruiter, Freemason, and the first Negro to be elected to Congress. Revels was born free to ancestors who were Croatoan Indians, and his mother apparently of some Scottish ancestry. He claimed his ancestors had always been free as far back as his knowledge extended. Revels lived a well-traveled life in his early years, first traveling to Indiana to study at Beech Grove Quaker Seminary, then to Drake Seminary in Ohio before being ordained at 18 years old, becoming an AME minister. Hiram was elected to the Regional Elder Council by the age of 22. Quote from House.gov Revels traveled throughout the country carrying out religious work and educating fellow African Americans in Indiana, Illinois, Kansas, Kentucky, and Tennessee. Although Missouri forbade free blacks to live in the state for fear they would instigate uprisings, Revels took a pastorate with an AME church in St. Louis in 1853. Noting that the law was seldom enforced, however, Revels later revealed that he had to be careful because of restrictions on his movements. I seditiously refrained from doing anything that would incite slaves to run away from their masters, he recalled. It being understood that my object was to preach the gospel to them and improve their moral and spiritual condition, even slaveholders were tolerant of me. Despite his cautiousness, Revels was in prison for preaching to the black community in 1854. Upon his release, he accepted a position with the Presbyterian Church in Baltimore, Maryland, working alongside his brother Willis Revels, also an AME pastor. Hiram Revels was the principal of a black school in Baltimore and subsequently attended Knox College in Galesburg, Illinois on a scholarship from 1855 to 1857. He was one of the few black men in the United States with at least some college education. When the Civil War broke out in 1861, Revels helped recruit two black regiments from Maryland. In 1862, when black soldiers were permitted to fight, he served as the chaplain for a black regiment in campaigns in Vicksburg and Jackson, Mississippi. In 1863, Revels returned to St. Louis where he established a freedman's school. At the end of hostilities, Revel served in a church in Leavenworth, Kansas. While traveling to Kansas, Revel and his family were asked to sit in the smoking car rather than the car for first-class ticket holders. Revels protested that the language in the smoking car was too coarse for his wife and children, and the conductor finally relented. Revel served in churches in Louisville, Kentucky, and New Orleans, Louisiana, before settling in Natchez, Mississippi in 1866. Before the Civil War, fewer than 1,000 free black Mississippians had access to basic education. Thus, leadership from freedmen such as Revels became vital to the Republican Party for rallying the new electorate in the post-war years. It was through his work in education that Revels became involved in politics taking his first elected position as a Natchez alderman in 1868. He entered politics reluctantly, fearing racial friction and interference with his religious work. But he quickly won over blacks and whites with his moderate and compassionate political opinions. In 1869, encouraged to run by a friend, future representative John Roy Lynch, Revels won a seat in the Mississippi House Senate. Under the newly installed Reconstruction government, Revels was one of more than 30 African Americans among the state's 140 legislators. 
Upon his election, he wrote a friend in Leavenworth, Kansas. We are in the midst of an exciting canvas. I am working very hard in politics as well in other matters. We are determined that Mississippi shall be settled on the basis of justice and political and legal equality. A little known politician, Revels attracted the attention of fellow legislators when he gave a moving prayer on the opening day of the session. With mixed results, Revels also promoted black American civil rights by less conventional means. In May 1870, he startled the military establishment when he nominated black candidate Michael Howard to the U.S. Army Military Academy at West Point, a long bastion of Southern white gentlemen. Revels knew Howard's parents, former slaves, and Howard's father had served in the state legislature. Critics claimed Revels callously and publicly humiliated the youth who had little formal education and was not admitted to West Point. And supporters claimed the school's administration's prejudice had blocked Howard's entrance. Additionally, Revels successfully appealed to the War Department on behalf of black mechanics from Baltimore who were barred from working at the U.S. Navy Yard in early 1871, an accomplishment he recalled with great pride, end quote. Revels lived in the spotlight for several decades, acquiring status and influence. But over his time in politics, his popularity began to wane as a result of his support of the Democratic Party, who were notorious in committing election violence against black voters. During a Senate hearing, Revels testified to not having any knowledge of any violence used against black voters during the 1875 election campaign. Whether his statements were true or not, his denial of voter violence didn't sit well with his constituency. Hiram Revels as one of the most notable Prince Hall Freemasons in American history. Birthplace of a branch of masonry that seeks to refute the tired old allegation that the order is only for tired old white men. We are entering a room that echoes with the history of American oppression and liberation. Prince Hall Lodge, named for a Revolutionary War soldier from Massachusetts founder of what remains a separate, self-segregated offshoot of the Masonic family tree. A brotherhood that has nurtured generations of black American leaders. Prince Hall Masonry counts among its members such community and national leaders as the Reverend Jesse Jackson. Andrew Young is, but Jesse Jackson isn't. Benjamin Sterling Turner, another North Carolina-born Freemason who ascended to politics, traveled a different course to Congress than did Revels. Unlike Hiram, Benjamin was born into slavery and forcefully relocated to Alabama after the death of his master at the age of two and has no knowledge of his parents. Quote from the Cornerstone Message, Volume 4, Issue 3, July 2016. Quote, Born on March 27, 1825 in Weldon, North Carolina, Benjamin Sterling Turner, like many others, was confined to the system of chattel slavery. Turner's parentage remains unknown. He was first owned by Colonel Neville G. and Elizabeth Harwell G. When Turner was two years old, Colonel G. died and Mrs. G. later married Mr. Thomas Turner. In 1830, she brought him to Madison County, Alabama. Just six months later, Mrs. Turner would be widowed again on May 2nd, 1830. Damn. Later that year, at the early age of five, Turner was forced to move with Mrs. Turner to Selma, Alabama to be closer to her children. At an early age, Turner is believed to have received his education from the lessons given to his playmates. His teen years went by fast. Upon becoming a young man, Elizabeth Turner sold Benjamin to Major W.H.G., her nephew-in-law, to pay off debts. Major G. was an affluent hotel and stable owner who married into the Turner family. Eight years later, in 1853, upon the death of Major G., Turner 
was inherited by Dr. James Turner G., Major G's son. Dr. G held a great amount of trust in Turner. Dr. G allowed Turner to earn wages, serve as the manager of the hotel, and entrusted him with the upkeep of the livery stable. With his increasing role in the upkeep and management of the G House Hotel, Dr. G found him invaluable because he would later serve in the Confederate Army from 1861 to 1865. By the 1860s, Turner had accumulated substantial wealth and garnered the respect and admiration of both black and white communities. During the war, Turner is documented as purchasing Confederate war bonds. In 1865, Union General James H. Wilson's troops swept through Alabama and destroyed nearly all of Selma's Confederate munitions plants to include the properties of Turner. Continuing, with persistence by 1870, Turner regained his wealth, and his wealth was valued at $10,000, approximately $188,000 in today's currency. In 1871, Turner was initiated, passed and raised in the Masonic Lodge in Godfrey B. Taylor Lodge No. 35, under the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Missouri. He served as junior warden and senior warden of Godfrey B. Taylor Lodge while under Missouri St. Mark Lodge No. 1, under Compact Grand Lodge of Alabama, and later St. Mark Lodge No. 4, under the Independent Grand Lodge of Alabama. It was in 1871 that Turner was elected as the first African American to serve in the United States Congress from the 1st Congressional District of Alabama. While in Congress, he, like others, were met with unspeakable prejudice. To the chagrin of many, it was Congressman Turner that saved the lives of hundreds of thousands of ex-Confederate traitors. Congressman Turner offered the Amnesty Act in the 41st Congress, which failed. However, with his determination and tenacity, it passed in the 42nd Congress. End quote. Turner was eventually unseated in Alabama's first congressional district in 1872 when another so-called African-American, Philip Joseph, entered the election and split the ticket, making the way for Democrat Frederick Bromberg to win the election. This essentially divided the black political power structure. Joseph, the Florida-born son of wealthy European immigrants and slave traders, entered the political ranks and in independent and was the acting president of the Union League, a clandestine men's club based out of northern cities created to displace their Democratic opponents under the guise of Freeman voter rights. After his loss in the election, Turner accused Joseph of being a secret agent of the rebel government. Basically, if an individual of color were traveling from a foreign destination to a new destination, uh, he could always feel assured that if he ran across a brother Mason, that he would be taken care of, uh, that he would have clothing if he needed it, he would have food, um, and that he would be put on the right path to con continue his travels, much in the way that the Underground Railroad functioned um, right prior to the Civil War. Josiah T. Walls was born enslaved in Virginia. During his teenage years, he was subjected to a bearer of burdens for the Confederate Army. During the Civil War, his regiment was eventually captured by the Union Army. Rising through their ranks, he ended up becoming a three-term congressman in Florida. Quote, Gerald A. Urso. Quote, Though born in slavery in the middle of the 19th century, Josiah Thomas Walls rose from the tethered pages of United States history to become the first African-American politician in the state of Florida. Additionally, as an initiate of the most worshipful Union Grand Lodge of Florida, he served honorably as a worshipful master of Rising Lodge No. 10 in Gainesville, Florida, as a well-respected district deputy grandmaster in northern central Florida. In 
Unbeknownst to many, Walls was intricately involved in the chartering of the infamous Rosewood Lodge 148 in Rosewood, Florida. Moreover, he contributed to the betterment of society as a politician, farmer, educator, landowner, and as an advocate for the welfare of his constituents. To this end, this article is submitted for an effort to increase general awareness of his numerous contributions and place Josiah T. Walls within the pantheon of great Prince Hall Masons. As a man dedicated to God and his country, slavery and personal adversity did not prevent him from becoming a congressional cornerstone and from making a positive impact in the annals of African American history. End quote. Gerald A. Urso, Prince Hall Mason. The charter was granted, and from that point on, um, it goes on and on up to this date. There are over 49 Grand Lodges in the Western Hemisphere and almost 400,000 Prince Hall Masons. So Prince Hall Masonry has thrived from that date. The end of slavery allowed Prince Hall Masonry to spread southward, a faithful facsimile of the ancient brotherhood with the same codes and costumes, yet never fully accepted as its equal. Jefferson Franklin Long arose to distinction after emancipation, taking up the occupation of Taylor and entering the political arena in the mid-1860s. By 1870, he was elected as a Republican to Congress, but only served an abbreviated term of less than two months. Georgia's refusal to go willingly into the Union stalled the black delegation's chances in Georgia for representation. It would be over 100 years until another so-called black Andrew Young would be elected to Congress in Georgia. Quote from House.gov Quote Long was the last black representative elected from Georgia until Representative Andrew Young won a seat in 1972. After leaving Congress on March 3rd, 1871, Long returned to his tailoring business in Macon. Although he remained active in politics, he never again ran for public office, recognizing that the white-controlled Georgia government had shut blacks out of politics. He campaigned for Republican candidates in 1872 and served as a member of the Southern Republican Convention in 1874 as a delegate to the Republican National Conventions from 1872 to 1880. Long eventually became frustrated by white Republican leaders' failure to protect black Southerners. By the late 1870s, he began encouraging African Americans to vote for independent Democrats if Republican candidates proved unsatisfactory. Political upheaval and sharp racial division in all the political parties had so disillusioned Long by the mid-1880s that he left politics permanently to focus on his business. However, his reputation as a radical politician eventually cost him his affluent white clientele. Unable to survive on the income from his tailor shop, he started other businesses including a liquor store and a dry cleaning shop. He remained self-employed until his death in Macon on February 4th, 1901. End quote. House.gov Robert DeLarge was born to a Sephardic Jewish father and a free woman of color who were both part of the mulatto aristocracy of Charleston, South Carolina. Quote, House.gov A wealthy resident of Charleston, South Carolina, Robert DeLarge won election to the U.S. House of Representatives as an ally of the scandal-ridden administration of the Republican Governor Robert Scott. I am free to admit... DeLarge noted on the House floor while advocating for victims of racial violence in the South that neither the Republicans of my state nor the Democrats of that state can shake their garments and say they had no hand in bringing out this condition of affairs. A protracted, contested election in which DeLarge's lack of political capital, prickly personality, and failing health conspired against him cut short the young politician's career. 
Robert Carlos DeLarge was born on March 15, 1842 in Aiken, South Carolina. Although some records indicate DeLarge was born a slave, he likely was the offspring of free mixed race parents. DeLarge's father was a tailor and his Haitian mother was a cloak maker. The DeLarge family owned slaves and as members of the free mixed race elite were afforded opportunities denied their darker skinned neighbors. Robert DeLarge was educated at a North Carolina primary school and attended Wood High School in Charleston, South Carolina. He later married and had a daughter, Victoria. DeLarge was a tailor and a farmer before gaining lucrative employment with the Confederate Navy during the Civil War. Perhaps regretting the source of his financial windfall, DeLarge later donated most of his wartime earnings to the Republican Party. Nevertheless, by 1870, he had amassed a fortune that exceeded $6,500. He moved within Charleston's highest circles and joined the Brown Fellowship Society, an exclusive organization for mixed race people. End quote. House.gov. Robert Brown Elliott was not born into slavery or even in America for that matter. He was from England, had served in the British military, and had received an elite education before stepping foot into the Republican Party of South Carolina. Quote, White colleagues received Elliot Cooley. His dark skin came as a shock as the other two African Americans on the floor Joseph Rainey and Jefferson Long were mixed raced. Described as the first genuine African in Congress, the first genuine African, although he was from England. All right. Elliot seemed to embody the new political opportunities and Southern white apprehensions ushered in by emancipation. Of the day he delivered his first speech, Elliot recalled, I shall never forget, I found myself the center of attraction. Everything was still. Furthermore, his politics were more radical than his African-American colleagues, and his unwavering stance for black civil rights made many representatives of both parties wary of his intentions. Elliot was given a position on the Committee on Education and Labor where he served during both of his terms. The current suspicion surrounding his arrival did not erode Elliot's natural confidence. He gave his maiden speech just 10 days after his swearing in, challenging the amnesty bill, which reestablished the political rights of nearly all former Confederates, and quickly followed that speech with another supporting the Ku Klux Klan bill aimed at curbing the terrorist activities of the clandestine organization. End quote. The legacy of Prince Hall and his black brother Masons is staring down an uncertain future. This is Richmond, Virginia. 500 Prince Hall Masons are gathering tonight to elect a new state Grand Master. At 48, Curtis Vaughan is the youngest Grand Master of the state. In his opinion, Prince Hall Masonry was essential to black society in the racially charged South. As was the case for many foreign-born blacks or mulatto children of European immigrants, participation within Prince Hall Freemasonry wasn't necessary for the aristocratic mulatto population to join. There was an obvious division of class festering among the Negroes. 
Rather than joining Masonic fraternal organizations, the nobility class Negroes created organizations and modeled them coalesced with elements of those societies, with one strict caveat. They refer to themselves as Africans. But by this time, the people were referring to themselves as African on both sides of the Boule spectrum. Hence the name of several organizations. For example, the Free African Society of Philadelphia, founded by two American-born slaves, Absalom Jones and Richard Allen, the latter founding the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Within the preambles of the Free African Society, the two men identify as Africans, although they are not. Statistically speaking, the probability of their ancestors being from Africa are nearly impossible, considering the majority of the so-called 400,000 African slaves traded into North America occurred after they were born. And most came from the West Indies via capture from the Southern colonies. Most of these free Africans had more immigrant European ancestry than anything else. The Free African Union Society, headquartered in renowned Jewish slave hub of Newport, Rhode Island, was founded even before the Free Africans of Philadelphia. Its membership consisted of only free blacks of the affluent slave city. One of its most notable members, Newport Gardner, who claimed African ancestry, was one of the earliest proponents of the Back to Africa scheme. Of the ports that did receive a higher influx of African slaves, Newport was definitely one of them. Newport Gardner was highly educated, an excellent musician and spoke two languages, but he was restricted from membership of the African Union Society because he technically was the property of Caleb Gardner. Through some unknown means, he was able to acquire freedom for himself and attain full membership into the organization. Although several of these organizations had strong church ties, some groups rejected religion altogether. One such group was the Brown Fellowship Society of Charleston, South Carolina, whose members include the quasi-black politician of Jewish ancestry, Robert DeLarge. In fact, Charleston, South Carolina had the largest Jewish population in colonial America. The Brown Fellowship Society had a reputation for rejecting all dark-skinned applicants, as attested to by black freeman Thomas Small. Non-white Europeans immigrated to America to be classified here as free people of color. Among these people were significant populations of Huguenots and Sephardic Jews. And of those groups of Huguenots and Jews, many were slave traders. So the idea that all slave traders were exclusively white is a complete fallacy. A significant portion of those credited with breakthroughs in the history of black America were the children of immigrant slave traders. For example, W.E.B. Du Bois ancestors were Huguenots who immigrated from Germany, had owned slaves in America since the late 1600s. His claim to West African ancestry is through his paternal great-great-grandfather who was owned by the Dutch. 
which means to his knowledge, out of four grandparents, eight great-grandparents, and 16 great-great-grandparents, one of them was possibly African. Du Bois was mostly a French-German Jew, descended from some of the first Dutch colonists in New York. And he resembled his European ancestors, who were not always classified as white. Undoubtedly, class and status divided the masses of captured indigenous Americans from the majority of colored European immigrants who were accelerated through their affluent wealthy families and benevolent societies limited to a specific napkin cloth of so-called African Americans. Joining Prince Hall would be considered a little too black for them. On the next episode of Boulé, we will highlight some of the blackest movements of the early 20th century on the next episode of Boulet.